The Archdiocese of Chicago is a vibrant and diverse faith community. We celebrate our faith through worship, evangelization, and reaching out to the needy. Welcome to Catholic Chicago. Welcome everybody to our show today. This is uh, Bob Gilligan from the Catholic Conference of Illinois and thank you for watching or listening today. We are now in the new Francis Cardinal George Studios, which is uh, quite nice. It's quite different from the radio. Uh, so we'll see how it goes here on our inaugural show at the uh, Cardinal Francis George Studios. It's more set up for TV, so it's gonna be a little bit of an adjustment, but I'm sure we'll make the best of it. Um, as always, we'll have uh, good content and hopefully informative information for you, uh, no matter whether you're listening or, or you're watching it. So today, uh, we're going to talk about two subjects that the Catholic Conference is intimately involved with. Um, one of them uh, is new to this legislative session. The other one is, unfortunately, still with us, but uh, we're still fortunately optimistic that we're going to be able to resolve this and continue the scholarship tax credit. So with us here uh, for our first guest is uh, somebody who I don't think has been on this before, but I know his organization has been. He is the new executive director at Empower Illinois, Bobby Sylvester. Bobby, you with us? Yes. Thanks, Bob, there for is. having me on. Yeah, through the magic of whatever this is. Uh, thanks for joining us. So, um, Bobby, congratulations on your new role here. Tell us now you are the, what is your title? You're the executive director of Empower but you're mainly leading up the advocacy component of Empower. Yeah, uh, so the, the title is Executive Director of Community and Government Affairs, and you know we're trying to get the Tax Credit Scholarship Program, which is authorized by the Invest in Kids Act, reinstated this May, if not sooner. So you were uh, intimately involved. You are very close to the advocacy efforts from last session. You basically led a lot of the grassroots organizing. So you have a pretty good finger on the pulse of what's going on out there in the not only the Catholic school community, but the non-public school community at large. Tell us what you're hearing from parents, from children, after the disappointing news from last November. Sure, uh, so, so certainly I, I think the focus should be on, on the parents. This has been a, a devastating news for them that the scholarships are going away because the legislators decided not to renew this program. Uh, due to pressure from special interest groups, uh, mainly the teacher unions, and so they're devastated. And we're now we're starting to see the see the real life consequences uh, of that decision. We're seeing some school closures. We're seeing families have to consider transferring out of the school that works best for for their kids. And so it, it's just uh, incredibly sad. But uh, people are also angry, and, and rightfully rightfully so. And uh, we're working on, you know, making sure that people have the opportunity to engage with their legislators so that they can uh, tell them that this is simply not acceptable and that we demand that the Invest in Kids Act be reinstated. So tell us a little bit about kind of the status of things. Now, uh, the legislature did not act. Uh, the program was a five year pilot program is actually six years because of COVID. So, but the law, tell us about the law. The law still exists, but the ability to donate does not. Is that correct? Yeah, you, you have that right, Bob. Uh, so the way the law is right now is since the 23-24 school year is ongoing, the students who received scholarships for that school year are, are still on the scholarships. They won't be affected, but they will be once uh, August, 20, uh, August of 2024 rolls around and they're trying to enroll for that school year, the 24-25 school year. And so the law remains on the books. The tax credit that helps enable this program by allowing ordinary people to be up to four times uh, more generous than they are typically is, is going away. Uh, and that's the part that that's really missing right now. Uh, and again, I wanna stress that that is for regular folks who are supporting their local school, very often the school that they went to themselves, that's been in their family for generations. And uh, that that's what kind of helped make this program possible. 
You know, there's been a, there was a lot of talk in Springfield about, uh, I'm not sure if this got into the mainstream m media, but I think it's worth focusing on just for a second here. There's a lot of talk about who was in the program and who was not on the program. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the number of minority students who are on the program versus the number of, of white students on the program? Because some people down in Springfield, I don't think this is the case in the press, but there was some opposition who was trying to portray this as a program that was just serving uh, white children that were, were already in the Catholic school system or non-public school system. Talk a little about who was really in the program and who really was not. Sure. Uh, great question. Uh, uh, you're right that unfortunately there has been a lot of misinformation uh, about this program, and that's that's willful on the part of our opponents. Um, I would even go as far to say that some of them are outright lying uh, to make their point on this program. But what I can tell you is, uh, as an, a scholarship granting organization, from our data, 58.5% of our students uh, all time, so meaning the entire history of the program, are minority students. So non-white uh, and the largest group there is the Latino community or the Hispanic community. Second largest group uh, is the African-American community. So this program is serving those who it is intended. And it is also crucial to underscore that every student who applies for and receives a tax credit scholarship is low income. That is built into the law. Um, so this is a program that is highly focused on uh, education equity and on serving the poorest of the poor, uh, and it does that. You know, we were down in Springfield last week and the week be two weeks before that, and we just started our conversations with lawmakers. Uh, tell us a little bit about the vibe or the feeling you're getting from from people who uh, were down there in November and what their attitude is coming into next year. Would you say that they are in the let's forget it guys move on category or there's hope here or uh, don't worry about it we're going to get this done? What, where, where would you kind of put them in a, in a sort of a general bucket list? Sure. I, I think they are very much in the category of there. there is hope here. Uh, no legislator that I've had a conversation with whether they are for this program, against this program, or kind of in the in the middle, meaning undecided, has ruled out an extension of this program. Uh, and I think that speaks to the the fact that it does serve uh, low income students, that it does serve minority students, and that the legislators have heard from their constituents uh, across the state. We have schools and families in every single legislative district in the entire state of Illinois. So this is a very local issue for all of the uh, all of our elected officials both Republican and Democrat. And we have support from both the Republicans and the Democrats. And so what I think happened, especially last fall, was we were up against the political calendar, which was uh, the elected officials were starting to get signatures to get on the ballot for the upcoming elections here in March and then in November uh, of 2024. And so they were very, very nervous uh, about uh, their reelection prospects. And uh, the teacher unions, among others, kind of went to them and said, if you vote for this, we're going to primary you. Um, so it was a brute force political threat. Uh, and shamefully, the elected officials prioritized their reelection over the needs of their constituents and the needs of their families. And that's why we are certainly upset. The families are upset. And that's why we're demanding that they reconsider this decision. And I think they're willing to. I think the timing was particularly difficult last fall when we were trying to do this, as you indicated, um, because you could still take out uh, um, uh, signatures, you could still get on the ballot. So a lot of people were concerned about how this would play in their district, and and some of them were just a little nervous about it. But perhaps the the, the political climate might be a little bit more favorable to us come after the March 19th Illinois primary that's coming up. So I think once that ends, I think we're going to see a sort of a, uh, okay, what, what, what the legislature will be in the, what do we need to do? What do we need to address still? Um, and who knows what's going to happen at the end? It's, it's, it's anybody's guess, but there probably will be significant asks and requests from the public teachers unions and from the public schools in general uh, for more money. So we'll see how that all plays out after March 19th. And so there's kind of a short time from between March 19th and May 31st. So this will be sort of a short, sweet, impactful time for us. So that's why I wanted to do this segment now to get re people ready for it. Um, Bobby, the, the campaign 
Uh, last year was characterized by large groups of people coming to Springfield. Uh, Empower Illinois in particular had the blue shirts. Um, the blue shirts were everywhere last year. Um, I'm sure there's going to be a presence in Springfield again, but I think the, the, the advocacy effort is going to look a little different this year than it did last year. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And it's certainly it's uh, a great time to start discussing this. We actually just yesterday sent out an email to all of our, our scholarship parents asking them to make an appointment to visit their state representative and their state senator in their district uh, over the next few weeks. And so uh, I think it will look a little different. Um, certainly, we are going to be in Springfield. We're going to have people in Springfield, maybe not quite the, the numbers that we've had in, in the past, but uh, we're looking forward to being back there and I'm sure we'll break out some blue shirts, uh, <laughs> but we're also going to be doing some activities uh, across the state, whether those are marches, rallies, again, school visits with legislators, going to legislators, district offices. So there, there's going to be a lot happening. And certainly we're, we're looking for people to share their stories on social media uh, as well. We'd love to work with you to get your story out to a broader audience so that people can hear and see from the real life people that are impacted by this program. Uh, and I think that that's crucial. And, you know, Bob, you mentioned uh, the, the public schools. Uh, and I just wanna make very clear that we at Empower and our, our coalition of, of mostly private schools across the state of Illinois, we are absolutely for uh, more funding for the public schools. We are, are great supporters of our, our public schools. And very often we have great relationships with them in terms of being able to collaborate on, on different uh, projects or different opportunities. And so we want them to be successful. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the public school teacher unions, particularly the Chicago Teachers Union, which has become radicalized, um, is you know trying to turn this into a private school versus public school thing, and it's, it's not. Um, we are for educating kids, period. Uh, it's a both and, and we shouldn't be playing politics with kids' education. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because uh, I think we've talked about this before, but last, I think it was in April, uh, Cardinal Supich wrote a letter uh, that appeared in the Chicago Tribune saying just what you said, uh, advocating for additional funding uh, that would go to the public schools that was passed in past years, and also advocating for increases to the MAP program, which is a very successful program that's used to fund scholarships, ironically enough, for low-income children so they can, attend, they can attend college or university. So we've been on record, and I know you guys have been as well. So tell us, Bobby, we got about a minute or so going, a uh, minute or so remaining. Uh, Empower Illinois, how do, if people hearing this, and we'll get this out, if people want to get more involved, they have a story to tell, uh, they want to contact their legislator, what's the best way to get a hold of you and Empower uh, so we can encapsulate everybody's uh, advocacy and everybody's energy? Sure. Great, great point. So I would strongly encourage everyone to follow us on social media. We're on Facebook at Empower Illinois. We're on Twitter uh, as well. And so those are great places to just stay in touch with us, be able to contact us and, and make sure that you're kind of seeing and hearing things uh, as things develop. I'd also encourage you to reach out to uh, one of our team members. Um, so there's, there's myself, there's uh, Katie, there's Chelsea, and our email addresses are really simple. So in my case, it's Bobby, B-O-B-B-Y, -B -B at EmpowerIllinois.org. Um, so we would love to uh, get an email from uh, whoever's listening and that they want to help. Um, the website is up on the screen right now. That's a great place to go for more information as, as well. So there's definitely a lot of different ways to, to get in touch with us, and we look forward to hearing with hearing from all of you, and we hope that you can lend your voice to this important campaign to make sure that low-income kids can continue to receive tax credit scholarships and stay at their best fit school. Great. Thanks so much for joining us, Bobby, for taking us some time this morning. Uh, thank you for all you're doing, and we're going to keep up uh, with the advocacy. And hopefully, God willing, come uh, May 31st, we'll have that scholarship tax credit program extended. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Bob. Don't go away, everybody. We'll be right back. We're going to switch gears with a new subject the Catholic Conference has been involved with. We're going to be talking to uh, Jeanette Malifa from our staff, the Director of Government Relations. She's going to be talking to us about recently introduced bill uh, that would legalize assisted suicide in the state of Illinois. Don't go away. We'll be right back.
Catholic Charities Loss Program was created more than 40 years ago to help survivors of suicide wherever they are in the grieving process. This nationally recognized program continues to offer a safe, non-judgmental environment where survivors of suicide can find community, direction, and resources for healing after suffering the devastating loss of a loved one. Online and in-person services are available for individuals, couples, children, and families of all faith traditions. To learn more, call 312-655-7283 or email loss at catholiccharities.net. Don't suffer alone. We are here to offer loving outreach to survivors of suicide. Contact Catholic Charities today. Forty-four for me teaching. When I started here, there were teachers here that had taught me when I was a student. Now I'm the old person. <laughs> right now, I teach junior high math. I love when kids find what I'm teaching to be fun and they get it. I see that light bulb go off and it's a thrill. People are always amazed. What? what? You're here for 44 years? It's hard for me to believe, frankly. <laughs> I love what I do. Every summer I think, oh, I miss the classroom. Even on the weekends, I think I can't wait to get back on Monday and teach those quadratic equations. <laughs> Shape the next generation of leaders. Teach. Apply today at artchicago.org slash schooljobs. Welcome back, everybody. This is Bob Gilligan from the Catholic Conference of Illinois, still getting a little adjusted to the cameras here. Uh, thank you for watching and, and listening to our program here today. Um, now we're going to switch gears a little bit uh, about a subject that's been talked about nationally, actually, not only nationally, but internationally as well. Uh, it's consistently in the news, uh, and unfortunately, 10 states have now legalized assisted suicide. And just last Friday, uh, legislation was introduced in our state legislature in Springfield by a state senator, Linda Holmes, to legalize assisted suicide in, in our state. So here today to join us in talking about that issue and presenting the church's perspective on it is uh, Jeanette Malafa. She is uh, the director of government relations at the Catholic Conference. And through the magic of technology, here she is today. Good morning, Jeanette. How are you? Good morning, Bob. How are you? Great. It's snowing in Springfield. And it's so nice and warm and sunny up here. It's a, actually, it's not bad. Jeanette, tell us a little bit about, we, as I was explaining in the intro, uh, the bill number, uh, Senate bill, I think it's 3944, if I have that correct. It was just introduced recently uh, by Senator Holmes. So um, it's kind of being digested right now by the legislature and the media. Tell us a little bit about the bill and, and, and what it purports to do. Um, interestingly, it uses the topic medical aid in dying, which we would not refer to that as. We will consistently call it assisted suicide because that's what it is. Tell us just a little bit about the bill and, and kind of where we are and the perspective on it. So first read of Senate Bill 3499 would allow an Illinois resident to contact their doctor and say to them verbally, First, I would like to um, commit suicide. This is a person that would have a terminal illness with six months left to live. Then they have to do a written response to their doctor and then one more oral response. If so, that goes into um, the doctor would then okay, approve the request for assisted suicide. And a second doctor would then have to um, look at the patient, look at their case, and they would have to sign off as well. Then um, the person would receive a prescription in the mail that they would self um, uh, take. They would take the medicine themselves. They would not be in a hospital or um, in, in some kind of medical facility, and they would take the medicine themselves. That is it in a nutshell. We see so much, uh, obviously the proponents uh, will have emotional, uh, very uh, 
uh, strong arguments for the bill because these people are, most of them, have been diagnosed with a terminal illness. They fear that they will suffer at the end of life, and that's why they want to end their life. Well, what, what is the simple response to, to somebody who is in that sort of situation? The simple response is there are other ways to um, manage the end of your life, right? There's palliative care. Um, there, you, you may refuse treatment. Um, you can fill out uh, directives as to um, how you want your, to, your life to finish naturally. Um, but ending your life before the end of your natural death is a problem. One of the dangers of this legislation is that that desire for somebody to want to terminate their life is, is a strong emotional argument, but it also has consequences. It's not like that can just, when we change the law to allow that, that has some consequences to all of us. Uh, and it also places us on a slippery slope to where some other states and countries are today. Um, is there any evidence of some of the, some of the unintended consequences of, of legalizing assisted suicide? Now, in other states, we have um, the ability to look at Oregon, the first state in the United States, um, who legalized assisted suicide 25 years ago. So it has expanded quickly. Canada, the same thing, where you see it goes from a terminal illness, uh, six months left to live, which cannot be predicted correctly. Nobody knows the time of when, or when they're going to die. But um, you, you've, it goes from six months now it can be for mental illness, anorexia. Canada in March is supposed to be rolling out. Um, it's not a terminal illness. One re way to get assisted suicide is just to um, have depression or mental illness. So we see these things growing quickly. Some states, you don't need to be a resident anymore. Vermont just made it where you can go to Vermont and get assisted suicide and not be a resident. This bill says you have to be a resident of Illinois. Um, but, uh, in the Netherlands, the first country in the world that legalized assisted suicide, they're now writing prescriptions for children. It's, it's, it's hard to imagine. And once you open up the door to legalizing such activity, it does lead to all these consequences. And I think one of the things that's frustrating for us here and anybody just watching this issue unfold is it changes the role of a doctor. A doctor is generally, or any medical professional, is generally right. perceived as an individual who's a healer, who wants to help prevent uh, or using drugs to cure illnesses. And this legislation changes that on its face. And it turns the perception of the doctor who's a healer into one that, well, might take to help you take, end your own life. And I think that's a little uh, daunting, I think, for all of us that are sitting here watching this. Um, one of the things also that uh, I, I think it's worth mentioning is, um, as you were saying, in, in other states, people will come forward, as you had indicated, saying that, okay, I just want to end my life in a peaceful manner. But th think about that. I mean, if, is it a peaceful manner that everybody's surrounded by nice music playing with their loved ones gathered around them? Is that, is that the scenario that everybody undertakes? I think the perception when you when um, the proponents will use phrases such as death with dignity, compassion, choices, um, I think people feel that they are um, laying in a hospital bed with a medical professional, perhaps getting um, something in their IV. This is not the case. These people are getting mailed a uh, it's not the same each time, just a, a bunch of barbiturates or and other medicine that will be just taken by themselves in their own living room or wherever they choose to take it. I do believe this law says you can't take it in public in Illinois. Um, and uh, no one knows how it's going to affect you, right? Medicine fi affects everybody differently. I've read a story about an elderly couple um, who decided they were going to go this route in a different state. And the husband took the drugs and the wife couldn't couldn't watch her husband go through what he was going through. She called 911. Um, it, it is not an easy death, yeah. but there is not a lot of research either because nobody's sitting in these people's living room with them taking notes. Yeah, it, it, exactly. It, it could be a very lonely end to somebody's life. 
uh, and and as you had indicated as well, what is what is the status with the remaining pills that have not been taken, or what happens with that drug? It could be laying around. Everything. There's all sorts of complicating issues with this, that under the guise of compassion for the purpose person who just wants to end their life in a peaceful manner, we need to take a step back and and really think about what we're what we're doing here. And I think what you're saying is that based on the experience in other states, what you've seen is the slippery slope argument. Today, it's for somebody with a terminal diagnosis. Tomorrow, it's for somebody who uh, it can't get housing. Then, then the next day, it's somebody who's got anxiety or depression. And the next day, it's not for somebody under over 18, it's under 18. Where does this sort of go is a very, very dangerous thing. And all we're trying to do is call attention to this and to cre create some pause on, on, on the whole issue. One of the other things, Jeanette, I don't know if you want to make a comment, but that, that what goes on in other states. Um, suicide, when at, at the, ironically, at the break, you, you may have seen that there was a, a public service announcement for Catholic Charities Program, which deals with people who are experiencing loss as a result of a suicide. What happens when we legalize a suicide? We're probably going to get more of it. Correct. Uh, there's a suicide contagion. Um, I think that's your phrase, Bob. <laughs> where, I think I stole that. <laughs> uh, um, uh, where when it becomes normalized um, and it becomes law, when it becomes the law of the land, suddenly, why not, right? It, it Everyone's doing it. Why not do it yourself? Your life becomes less val valuable. I think, I think the, the, what I want to say about this is there's multiple layers why this is wrong, right? So theologically, your gift, your life is a gift, right? So as Catholics, we should not be destroying anything that God has given. Then there's a whole philosophical debate on this humanity. We've talked about how, you know, if you come across somebody that's suffering, you don't say to them, they're like, I want to end my life, and they're standing on the ledge. Nobody is going to say, let me push you, right? You're going to say, no, get off the ledge. Um, so there's a whole compassion piece that just does not go right with human human law, correct? And then there's this pragmatic part that you've been talking about, Bob, with insurance companies. Yeah. Um, there are examples in other states where um, people with rare diseases, um, expensive diseases, people that know that they're high cost, such as people in the disabled community, they're being denied treatment. We all know how expensive medical care is. It is not just, oh, well, you know, your life is worth $3.26 or whatever the prescription is um, for your assisted suicide. What's an insurance company going to do? Profit becomes more important than a person. And that's sad. It's so true. You know, how many of us have received uh, our bill after a, a medical uh, experience and then looked at the, 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 the charges and insurance companies, you know, denied coverage, denied coverage. And, and if you're in a, in a vulnerable position, that's not what you want to be reading. If this is a legalized option for you, what is the most right. expeditious way that, unfortunately, this situation can be handled? So there's a lot of uh, things out here that we need to take pause on to think about. Um, Jeanette, so the bill has just been introduced. Where, where do we go from here? What, what happens next? So uh, there's a legislation that was put out there. Uh, it's now February the whatever this is, the, <laughs> the 20th of February. Uh, the session will conclude in May. Uh, what do you think happens from here? Normally what would happen is a bill is introduced, it gets assigned to a committee. That's where the public hearing process starts. So that's where people have a chance to go in, proponents and opponents, and say why this is and isn't a good bill. We don't know which uh, committee they will send it to. It's going to start in the Senate. So um, after, if enough senators think that this is a good bill, then it would go on to third reading in the Senate. After that, the same process would start in the House. After that, if it, if something like this terribly would pass both houses, um, then the governor could would have to sign it or veto it. Um, so yep. hopefully we can get enough people and enough pressure to say that this is just a ridiculous thing for Illinois. We should be more compassionate about the people that are suffering than just say, Oh, well, well, it's easier. Here, take a pill. And that's probably a good segue to wrap up this segment, which is that the Catholic Conference of Illinois will be putting out material 
uh, to the Illinois bishops, and the bishops will be forwarding that off to uh, various parishes all across the state, explaining this issue in a little bit more detail, unpacking many of the things that Jeanette and I have been talking about, and hopefully making it easy for people to a, be educated on this and understand what to do about it. So, um, but that is coming hopefully very soon. That'll be out, and people will know what to do. That's pretty much wraps up our segment. Jeanette, thanks so much. Uh, for taking some time here to explain this very complicated subject. We'll be back next month to deal with this and other subjects. This is Bob Gilligan of the Catholic Conference of Illinois, and thank you for watching.